Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And Justin Williams is here as well, my co-host. Justin, how you doing? Good morning, Matt. Yeah, I'm here with you from Odessa, Texas, which uh, only fitting for the podcast, right? Yeah, only fitting and only fitting for today's subject, actually, which is going to be Justin telling us about his journey in the ownership of mineral rights and royalties, all of the things that he's learned along the way, mistakes that he's made, the, the learnings, the best practices that he's picked up. So we wanted to share this with, with you guys so that you could pick up on this and it'd be a shortcut to getting up that learning curve as you are starting your journey. So Justin, let's just dive in and talk a little bit about your story. I know for some of the listeners, they've heard uh, the interview that I did, you know, I guess it's been now a couple of years ago, but just when you talked a little bit about your history and your family history with ownership of minerals and royalties and working interests and things like that. And so just for those that maybe haven't heard that yet, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you came into owning mineral rights and, uh, you know, a little bit about how you came into this side of oil and gas? Absolutely. And so, you know, I think my story is is very similar to others um, and many others in that have go through this. But it all started out with uh, a landman contacting my mom and saying, hey, um, I have these minerals in West Texas. You are the owner. I want you to sign a division order and we want to try to move on with development of the well. And this was news. Um, and so my mom thought, no, I don't. You know, this has never come up before. Um, this is not something I knew was passed to me. And they, she just simply thought they had made a mistake. And I think there were several months of going back and forth with the landman saying, no, ma'am, you own this. Are you ready to take it? And my mom saying, nope, nope, not mine. Uh, I think you got the wrong person, so on and so forth. And, you know, that was the initial contact from us. And it really started making questions for us. Was there something? And I grew up in Odessa knowing that my family had been in, in mineral rights or minerals and royalties, uh, but we didn't know that there was anything left to be passed down. And I think that's so common for so many other mineral right owners. They may be aware of it to some degree, but they had no idea that there's something left to be passed down. That sounds like a very common thing. I do, you know, I hear from others, you know, a lot of times that, you know, hey, I've just found out that I own these mineral rights or these royalties. And to your point, I think a lot of it is when a landman contacts them for the first time to ask them to sign a lease, or you know maybe they get an unsolicited purchase offer. I know that over the past five years or so, with the shale boom, that you know all the drilling going on, and there were a lot of folks out there um, speculating and trying to pick up minerals and royalties and in certain areas where there was going to be drilling going on. So a lot of times, the first um, experience with that real property right that somebody inherited was that initial contact, whether it's a out of the blue call or a letter that is asking them to sell or lease. And then they have to really uh, quickly learn about what it is that they own. What are their rights? What are they, what are their responsibilities? You know, what do they need to do? What are their options? And so, you know, that is a very common theme. I, I agree. Now, as far as your mom is concerned. So she didn't even know about this. You, you mentioned that you did have some family history in the industry. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know you've talked to me in the past about your uh, great uncle and you know his career in minerals and royalties. And in fact, I think he was featured in a, in a book, wasn't he, that talked about the oil field in West Texas in the 60s and, and 70s and 80s. You want to talk a little bit about that? That's absolutely correct. And, you know, I think initially more than anything, um, the the polite persistence of the landman who was David Powers, and thank goodness he was so um, politely persistent, it really opened up a can of worms of us wanting to know our family history. How how did this happen? What all was out there? Um, what occurred? And through doing some research, we found that um, Jake Wallace, who was my great uncle, he was a oil and gas producer and independent in West Texas um, and would work with other companies to go out and drill wells. And I stumbled across a book called Roughnecks and Tool Pushers by Gerald Lynch, um, which talks to that time period, which was in the late 50s, early 60s, 
when these guys were out in the field um, drilling. And Jake started out as a working on a drilling rig. And through family stories, we found out that his older brother, Mutt Lawless, actually started out in Louisiana, moved off to West Texas. And Jake was actually denied positions because he was too short and had too big of ears. That's what that's what he uh, had said in this book was the reason he couldn't get onto the rig. And I guess eventually somebody decided to give the man a, a chance. And uh, he started out drilling with Marathon out in West Texas. And uh, they lived in a trailer together. And that was how it all began. And uh, Jake, from that time on, I guess, learned quickly and started uh, purchasing his own mineral rights and being in the right places at the right times to to acquire those mineral rights, uh, which is just an incredible story that, you know, to think that this is only a couple lifetimes ago, but it, it can be so easily forgotten. That's a, a great point. You know, these assets, you know, they can set up generations for, you know, an amazing legacy, an amazing asset and potential wealth associated with that. And so it's really cool that you guys were able to, uh, I guess, recover the, that property that, that was yours and to find out about it, you know, right before uh, everything really started happening. And, you know, let's talk, we'll talk a little bit about the details here and, and how this came to be, some of the details and getting the properties in your name. I think that's an, a very common issue that people have and they're trying to figure out, okay, what do I do next? You know, who do I call? So I think this will be helpful as well. So let's talk about once the landman convinced your mom that she actually did own these mineral rights, what did she have to do uh, you know, to, to claim them or to get them in her name so that she could start receiving royalties? Do you want to talk a little bit about what was the paperwork, what were the, the ownership documents, kind of that chain of title and, and all of that? Can you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And so through doing research, um, one of the top concerns for my mom was she wanted to be sure that she did actually own this and that it wasn't something that uh, was incorrectly being passed to her. And from talking about this, we learned that there was a a trust that my mom was vaguely aware of um, when Jake passed away and the mineral rights went into the trust. um, But it was her belief that she was not a part of the beneficiaries for that trust. And, um, you know, as I think many people do when, when family members pass, it's not something that you really want to go research at the time. The The memories are too painful and, and you want to remember that person for the love and the person that they were, not the things that they had. Um, and so I think many years went by without doing any research and come to find out that she was a beneficiary of the trust. And so first thing we did is went back to uh, that will and testament and those trust documents and tried to understand where did this actually come from um, and how much do we own and do we actually own it? Are we sure? And once we got through those hurdles, the landman really wanted us to to do everything we needed to do to get those minerals in our name, like you mentioned. And for us, that process was filing uh, the wills and testaments of her father, um, the other people between Jake and her, and making sure that that chain of title was very clear to her ownership. And there was several documents being filed. We had to go get certified copies of wills and testaments. I'm going to get those filed within the county. And then last but not least, we had to sign that division order. Um, and at the time, um, there's no way I could have had any idea what was on that paper was correct. But we were just happy to be being paid. <laughs> yeah, that's a very common response, I think, where you're just thankful for this kind of unexpected money that comes your way. And so it's a nice surprise. But then, you know, uh, the next step is usually, okay, so now we own this let's figure out exactly what we own. And then, you know, is there other stuff out there that we don't know about? You know, this landman maybe is contacting us because of this one well that they want to drill. And so they've, you know, there's an immediate need, but then, you know, are there other tracks that are sitting out there that are going to be in a similar, you know, situation here sometime in the near future, if someone else goes and wants to lease it or wants to drill a well. So how did you go back and research all of the things that your mom had inherited in that trust was it something that was outlined very clearly in the in the trust itself or did you have to do any other research so you know that's a really interesting one and for others that uh have family who've passed away in west texas or maybe texas in general um, i've heard many times that the jake lawless's will and testament which is the source from where most of this came was uh quote unquote a good old west texas will And, uh, you know, I think though the intention was to clearly lay things out, I think it created some ambiguity. And when we started doing research into the trust, we found that there were 
um, through his will and testament, there were actually three different trusts created. Um, and I don't think that's terribly uncommon with wills or trust. Um, but in this scenario, the, there were three trusts, one of which did not apply uh, because he passed away prior to his wife. So that took care of one of the trusts. The other two were very ambiguous into what property went through those articles and, and by virtue created separate trust. And my mom was a beneficiary of one of those articles that created um, a chain for or a way for the property to pass, but was not a beneficiary of another one of the articles that created a trust. And for us, it, it was just time speaking to attorneys. Um, we spoke to several attorneys, um, a couple of which that were just, con- just as confused from, as us. Um, and we just persevered and kept talking to attorneys. And, and thank goodness we, we met Spencer Cox, who has been a great friend of the show and uh, a wonderful advisor to us personally and our family. Uh, but he really took the time to dive in and understand every single word of the trust and how it would apply to us. And uh, we just really wanted to be sure that we were never taking anything that wasn't ours, uh, but that we were getting everything that was ours. And so that was a pretty long process, but eventually we we were able to get it ironed out and to understand exactly what was owned. Um, And then once we understood what percentage of the estate we owned, the question became, well, what was in the estate? Okay, we know what percentage of what was in the estate we own, but but what exactly all was in the estate? Um, so then we went and, and got an inventory of the estate and tried to um, do the best we could to track back through the inventory of the estate and the properties that were listed there to see what might be left and what might, might be remaining. Through that process, we certainly found several properties, but of course, as things go, the, the properties which are of most value today were not included in the inventory of the estate at all or even mentioned. Um, and so we just had to kind of continue burning down the information and looking in county records and continuing to try to make sense of what was here. And I would say really what made the difference for us was going back and asking the operators how they understood it when what information they had and how they saw it. Um, and that helped us so much to connect the dots between what operators were saying was out there and that we might own and connecting what percentage of that we might actually own through the will and testament and the trust. That makes sense. I think that, like you said, having the operator tell you, okay, well, I think I own this, but can you confirm, you know, because when uh, an operator goes to drill a well, they do what's called a title opinion. So this means that they run title in a very thorough manner to make sure that they are not going to be trespassing on anyone's, you know, minerals that has not signed a lease with them or that is not, you know, meeting certain conditions so that they can be considered perhaps, uh, you know, an unleased co-tenant in the situation in uh, Texas because there is not a statutory pooling provision. So what Justin's actually talking about there is, you know, getting a, a feel for that title opinion based on that operator, operator's interpretation of the title to that property, what it is that you own. And so they're going to be willing to tell you that because they'll have some additional requirements potentially for you to clear title if there are any title defects. So I know, Justin, you had a few title defects that you ran into. And, you know, how did you go about finding out about those? And, and what did you have to do to clear those up? We certainly did. And this is where I think the the fun really began. And, um, you know, I think at this point, um, early in the journey, I I was moving through the motions. And um, I think this was right around the time, Matt, that I had met you. And um, thankfully, there was some pretty good information out there that let me kept going step to step. But I hadn't yet understood what I was doing. And at this point, we had um, understood that that what we owned on this particular property, um, and we understood what that property was and, and what the actual mineral rights that were there over overriding royalty versus actual mineral rights versus whatever it was. Um, but now we had to clear up that chain of title, like you're mentioning. And the operators had said, well, we have a title conflict or, or um, a title defect here with the lawless chain of title. And they were referring back to the article, um, the separate articles in the trust and not being sure of which article that property actually passed through. And so we continued moving forward and found out, okay, the trustee of the trust, there was an individual place as a trustee who was no longer living and passed away about 10 years earlier. Um, But there was also a trustee named in the trust uh, as a bank. And so 
Bank One, Odessa, was na- uh, named as an additional trustee. And as many people might be in West Texas know, Bank One hasn't been around for several years. They were acquired by Chase. And uh, so by virtue, Chase now was the trustee of this trust. And uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to make a business or a bank aware that they are the trustee of a trust for a trust that hasn't maybe been touched in 20 plus years. Uh, But that is really quite the battle. And we initially went walking into a Chase branch and the um, wonderfully helpful um, teller was way blindsided, had absolutely no idea where to point us, um, but really tried her best to get us in contact. And after many months of of searching and calling, and and we were able to get into contact with somebody inside of Chase that was able to execute a deed for us. And so they um, very carefully reviewed the trust. They very carefully reviewed um, what Spencer had to say about ownership and eventually came to the determination that, yes, they were going to issue a deed for our percentage of the ownership for that property to help us clear out the title defect, which was them not having any idea what article of the trust that it passed through. And so by doing that, Chase took the liability away from the operator and picking who who had what ownership, um, and they were happy to proceed with getting us into pay status. And then we found out, as you mentioned, Matt, that we were unleased co-tenants in Texas, um, which was a real question mark, which appeared and, and a whole another thing to learn. Yeah, we we actually recently covered this subject, and so uh, you know if you're in this a similar situation as Justin, we're Maybe you own some minerals or royalties in Texas. The operator is telling you that you are an unleased co-tenant. Then you know this is something uh, that you can find out more about. And this is an episode that we've recorded, and we'll we'll be issuing it here. By the time this goes live, that'll be out there. So we'll link to that episode in the show notes. Uh, and that's a, a not an uncommon situation because the operator has to go forward with you know developing. The, the tracts of land, and especially in West Texas, where minerals and royalties get so fragmented and, you know, you have such a large number of owners, and a lot of which are in a sim- similar situation to you, Justin, where, you know, they just don't even know that they own it. And the people that are running title, you know, you can only go so far as to trying to contact the person of record. You know, it's it's a, a whole nother you know, level of effort to go and try to identify the heirs of that person and try to identify who they are, where they're, where they live now, try to contact them. And so usually what ends up happening is, so once the trail ends, as far as who actually is the current owner of that property, they'll try to contact the person of record and that who they see is the owner. And a lot of times those people have passed away and so they're unable to contact them. And so they need to do something with that interest. And in Texas, the way that that is handled is you become an unleased co-tenant and you basically are a working interest owner until you, until they recoup a certain amount of that initial drilling and completions cost. And so that's just a mechanism that they, that's in place to allow the operator to move forward, to have some way to handle that interest. And should an owner show up down the road and, and they can then figure out, you know, how to handle it. So, so that is a, a common situation in Texas uh, and other places. What can happen is you become force pooled and it's a similar provision. It just depends on your state. So you would need to go to your state oil and gas commission's website to find out how that's handled uh, in the state where you own minerals. If you've found out recently that maybe you're in a similar situation, because if you do get force pooled, some states will have you basically get the most common, you know, you have the option to get the the best offer that's out there, the most competitive offer that the operator has to publish with the Oil and Gas Commission, or it could be a similar situation where you get the statutory minimum royalty, so you you do get paid royalties, and then you back into a working interest basically once that penalty is is paid off as well, and then you get your full undivided interest in that particular well or those wells, and so. You just need to do some research and find out, you know, how that's handled in your state, and then and then you can go from there. And you know, of course, an attorney can help you navigate that and uh, and make sure you're doing all the right things. So, you know, we talked a little bit about that the the trust situation, and I know you'd mentioned to me that after you went through the process of contacting Chase and getting a deed 
there was then later um, a question by the operator that, well, actually, we think the ownership interest is incorrect. We think the article was misinterpreted by them. You have a different interest. Can you talk through that whole process and, and kind of was that something you were expecting or were you totally surprised by that? Yes, I was certainly totally surprised. And I, I learned a couple of lessons that day. And I think the first lesson I learned was that um, the various operators talked to each other. Um, Shell and uh, Inadarko at the time were in close communication about the interest. And one of the uh, division order analysts at Inadarko was very thorough in catching that there was actually an article, one of the articles of the trust, the way that it had flowed through to Jake's wife and then flowed back through from her will and testament as to where the interest had gone back into the trust, um, that there was actually a conflict on the marital share. So in Texas, there's a marital share of 50% and that Florence, his wife, would have had control of that 50% and, and in what trust it was returned into. And so the question came up, okay, what about this marital share? Okay, we knew, we understand that, yes, you're a beneficiary of this article of the trust, but this was split in half prior to you receiving the interest. And what about that half? And so very quickly, it became very apparent, and we contacted Spencer, and, and he fully agreed that the uh, division order analyst was correct in the way that she was interpreting it. And I had to hang my head and go back to Chase and ask them to issue another deed for this interest because the original deed was for an incorrect amount. Um, and this, thank goodness, it was too much, not too little. They were very quick to want to fix um, issuing too much so that they didn't create any liability for anybody else. And we had a ton of concern um, at that time because we had signed a lease and we were just really concerned about any liability that might be out there for us and because we had made a mistake and, and signed a lease off of that. And, um, you know, I think for me, more than anything, it was extremely eye opening into how much I did not know and how important it was that I became educated on what I was doing because it was, there was no, the attorneys were wonderful, but there was, I had to have a complete understanding of this so that I could be sure that these mistakes didn't repeat themselves. And thankfully, everybody along the process was really kind and willing to fix it, but we certainly felt like we were caught with our pants down. And I wanted to learn more to be sure that I didn't go through this again. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, usually that's unfortunately the way it goes. You find out that maybe you, uh, you had too much and then, then it's like, well, shoot, you know, this, this feels you know, it's, it's a bad feeling. You get that sinking feeling that, you know, while well, these checks that I were getting, you know, were, were really nice before. So what's it going to be going forward? How much less do I actually own? And so, you know, that's a, a definitely a sinking feeling. I've had that happen on a, on a couple of properties that, well, I, I, let me just say, I, I had a suspicion that it might've been incorrect. The division order showed a, a particular interest. And then after actually the, um, the property, I believe was, was sold to another operator, they came back and said, well, actually, this is the the interest. And then there's an adjustment period, right? Because you were paid too much over a period of time, and then they have to recoup that and, and to, to make everybody whole. And so, you know, did you, did you experience that, Justin? Did you see those checks have some sort of a, a deduction for that change in interest? And sort of what was that process like? Thankfully, the, the one that was in question, it hadn't gone to any kind of pay status yet. Um, so we were fortunate in that way that we hadn't already been paid out for something that um, we didn't own. It was really just the lease and the leasing bonus that we were super concerned about. Um, again, thankfully that royalties hadn't come in. And I'm sure had royalties started coming in, we certainly would have seen a deduction from the operator to offset those. Um, thank goodness it wasn't the case. But it was it was if nothing else, it was extremely eye-opening and was something that from that point forward, um, you know, I knew that I had to learn more and I had to find somebody who could teach me more and try to understand this. And I, you know, this for me was when I think I really started trying to understand what a title search was. How do I do a title search? Um, what in the world are these documents that I'm looking at? And Matt, I know there was a phone call with you and I, I can't imagine how it was on the other side of the phone, but the information helped a lot. And with that first phone call and even the first two or three times with different people, I had absolutely no idea what I was hearing. Um, but the repetitions were slowly making it sink in little by little. It's a learning process and it takes time. And so don't feel bad if 
you know, you feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose when you get started. You know, there's a lot of terminology to figure out. There's, uh, you know, the whole process to figure out as to how you clear title, how do you get it in your name, how do you notify the operator, how do you then make sure if there's an existing well there that you're in pay status and that you start receiving those royalty checks. And so there's the saying, if you're going to eat an elephant, you just got to take it one bite at a time. And so it's sort of like, like that, I think, where you just have to go step by step. You know, if you find out that you own minerals or royalties, first try to find out what it is that you own. And to your point, Justin, I think it's, uh, you know, the first step that a lot of people should do. And really the primary step for anybody is to know what you own. And so the first step in doing that is to oftentimes go to the county courthouse and ask the clerk there, say, hey, I need help. I just found out that I own minerals and royalties. I'm trying to do some research on um, my relative. You know, here's what I know. Can you help me? And a lot of times they're they're very helpful. And I know you've shared uh, your experience with that in the past and how they've helped you and said, okay, here's how you can here's where you go, here's what you do, here's, here are the steps to actually research that and, and find that out. And then we have a couple of episodes that we'll link to in the show notes as well on how to perform a title search, because a lot of these records are fortunately online now. And so you actually don't have to go down physically to the courthouse, but you can just run a search on the internet. And um, whether it's directly through the county clerk and recorder, or a lot of times there's third party uh, websites that will allow you to do this as well. Uh, for a small fee. But uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience in actually doing the title search? What what did that look like and and what did you learn? Absolutely. And and after I had uh, talked on the phone with you, Matt, I think my my big takeaway was, okay, I needed to do a a title search. I needed to go looking in the county clerk and recorder offices for the the county in which the property was owned. And that's where I needed to start it. And I think the, the first several times that I had searched through the documents, I probably read um, hundreds of documents, but I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at. I'm completely sure that I saved most of these documents at least 10 times and deleted them um, just to replace them again with the exact same documents because I didn't understand. And the first example of, of, I think, of what I was coming through um, that I really wasn't understanding was the different purposes of the documents. You know, what was a quick claim versus a lease? What was an overriding royalty? What was a deed? You know, what were the different things that I was looking at here and how did they apply to And that was really confusing to start. And I know, Matt, I had another conversation with you um, and just started Googling these and trying to understand how these might apply to me and, and what was worth something and what was worthless. Yeah. You know, when in doubt, copy anything that has your relative's name on it. You know, you may not need it down the road, but if you don't have it, you know, then it's a, an extra step to have to go back and try to find that missing document. So, you know, don't worry if you don't understand what each document is for. As long as you have all of it, then the person that can help you, whether it's a landman or an attorney, uh, they can weed through that and help you determine, uh, you know, how much you own. And so, that is where the title search comes in handy is just understanding what it is that you own, what are the interests. So what you usually want to do is run title from what's called patent to present. So that's from when that land was originally patented or granted to somebody by the U.S. government. And then every step along the way in that chain of title when it was handed down from one person to another. And so you need to trace that back through time back all the way to you so that you have basically the documentation to prove that you're the owner. And that's why title search is so important. There is, you know, a way to do it. If you don't have time, you have a, you've maybe inherited a fairly sizable interest. It might be worth hiring a landman or an attorney to help you with this. I think landman usually is a little bit cheaper. If you're looking to do it on your own, then you can do a lot of this work and then hand over what you find to a landman or an attorney to fill in the gaps and to uh, to finish it if you're not sure. So that's another, another option that might save you some money. Uh, but that is a very important step. And I know a lot of times when people do a title search, they find out there are other tracks that are out there that they didn't even know about. So did you experience that as well? 
I did. And it took me, um, I would say, at least a year, maybe even closer to a couple years to really understand, you know, how buying and selling leases apply to it, um, how to research what leases might be active today and were inactive today. Um, but through continuing and persevering and continuing to do research, I found um, two other properties, uh, one of which was uh, in production at the time that I found it, and another that later within a couple of years was put into production. Um, and these properties were in Reeves County. And I started to see a repeating pattern, which was that there was this title issue that was the, the multiple articles within the will and testament that kept being repeated. And so many of these people hadn't reached out to us or had tried to reach out to us, but weren't able to get into contact with us. And that these title issues were holding up them putting us into pay status or even maybe even moving on to, you know, sending out checks to, to achieve money or whatever it might be. Um, this was something that I was going to have to be proactive and going and looking and trying to be aware of anything that might be going in, into production or um, anything that was in production. And then I needed to be proactive to reaching out to the operator and saying, hey, I know there might be a title issue here, but I'm here to correct that title issue and I have everything you need to move this forward. That's an important step. I think you know, contacting the operator, letting them know as soon as you find out that you might own a tract, you know, to say, hey, if this is in pay status to the previous owner or, or, or other people, you know, at least for this interest, I'd like it to be placed in suspense. I think I'm the rightful owner. Here are the documents. And then at least it's not, um, those royalties aren't continued to being paid to the wrong person. They at least put that on hold, basically. That's what the suspense means. They just put it on hold uh, until they can correct the uh, the ownership of that particular interest to make sure the right person is getting paid. So that is an important step to just, you know, search for the company. And Justin, how did you go about finding, you mentioned um, that you, you found out that some of the properties were in production and some weren't. How did you go about finding if there were producing wells on the on that property? So thank goodness, um, the properties are in Texas. And so the, the RCC was a wonderful resource to be able to go back and look at production and even lease documents and so on and so forth. But truthfully, um, the real thing was contacting the operator. Um, and there were a couple properties where I reached out to the operator and they said, yeah, sure, no problems. You can send in a change of ownership, but there hasn't been any royalties for this in, in eight years or maybe even longer. And so that was, it became pretty apparent pretty quickly what, what if there was or wasn't anything there anymore. Yeah, that's a great point. The Texas Railroad Commission has an excellent website. You can search. There's a map interface. If you prefer to search that way, you can look up by uh, by the legal description. So if you know the abstract or the survey of the property, you can quickly search that and it'll uh, hone in on that in, on the map and then you'll see whether or not there are, there are wells that might intersect that tract. And, uh, you know, again, you just need to do a little bit of research. The documentation on the Railroad Commission website for the wells, a lot of times they'll have plats or maps for those specific wells showing the tracks that are pulled together uh, for that particular well. So you could see, are you part of that well or, or not? And so that's uh, where you would need to go to do what Justin's talking about to find out, you know, if there's a existing well there, if it's a horizontal well, especially, or if there is a permitted well, again, this is a, that's a great opportunity because that well has not yet started producing oil and gas. And so you have the opportunity to notify the operator before they start drilling, before they start producing and paying someone else. And so you can get those initial uh, royalty payments, which are usually, you know, with these shale wells, you get the majority of the production in the first year. And so that can be a nice, um, a nice check at the beginning. And then, and then uh, you get most of the, the royalties in that time period. So, you know, as you were going through this process, you learned more, you found you know, that you were gaining experience, you were gaining knowledge through this. What were some of the resources that helped you um, through all of this? I mean, first and foremost, Matt, I mean, you are a wonderful resource and I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to to walk me through this. And I know that you get so many people who are in the same position and it's not the first conversation you had, but it was very calming to, to hear somebody that understood it and that, um, uh, this was not something that was completely unusual and that nobody had ever gone through, uh, but that this was something that there is a process and a procedure to, and that you could learn it. 
And a great tool for me was um, at the time it was called Drilling Info. Now it's Inverse. Um, but they have a courthouse free trial that allowed me to do uh, searching in the county records um, in states that have a majority of it online. Um, and that was an amazing resource. And I spent way too much money um, before I had any idea what was going on and what I was looking at. But it allowed me to go in and look at the documents and kind of track them back and continue to do that. And then online, so continuing to read information, um, trying to digest anything I could find on how it worked. And most of all, speaking with an attorney. So learning all of this information, being able to go back and speak with Spencer about my specific estate and how this information that I had learned did or did not apply to my specific estate, I think was really the most valuable in the end, because there are so many different scenarios like unleased co-tenants that can apply to people, but may not apply in your specific case. And uh, really, it takes an attorney who this is what they do every day, to be able to really read between those lines and understand exactly where you stand and exactly what might and might not apply to you. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's the biggest thing is having a you know trusted advisor on your side. And, and I would highly recommend finding a qualified attorney in the state uh, you know, that's licensed in the state where you find out that you own minerals and royalties because then they can be your go-to person for, you know, if there's any other properties that show up that you need to clear title on, maybe you need to go through probate uh, or something like that, then having somebody that's familiar with estate law as well as oil and gas is really critical uh, because they can kind of hold your hand through all of that. And that's definitely money well spent because in, in the absence of that, really the property you can't realize the full value of that property because the operator is not going to be willing to pay you until the liability of that payment is taken away through the recording of a deed that shows you're the owner of record. And so that is an important step, you know, getting a, a qualified attorney. The other thing too is, you know, a lot of times these are unexpected payments that you receive. And so, you know, having an accountant that's familiar with how oil and gas uh, royalties and minerals are taxed is also a really valuable thing. So when you get that lease bonus check that you know how that should be treated, you know, as royal, as, as um, ordinary income versus, you know, the royalties that come in and what are some of the tax deductions that you can take, uh, like what's called the depletion deduction and things like that so that you make sure that you're paying you're paying your fair share of taxes but you're also getting your fair share of the uh the benefits of that property and the deductions and expenses you know if you had to do a title search or something and you know, how do you treat that can you expense that against the income you receive from that property and, and things like that so an accountant an attorney and then you know if you do find that you do want to sell, uh, you know, some people want to keep these in the family, so to speak, and have it as a legacy for their kids. And other people say, well, this is a great surprise. I have other things that I'd rather spend this money on. You know, maybe I want to pay off my house or do something like that. And it's, you know, really just an individual decision that you need to make. You know, maybe there's a you know, financial advisor that you need to talk to, to get some advice on what you should do. But, uh, you know, the important thing, if you do decide to sell that, you know, how much the property's worth so that you get a fair amount for that property. It's very easy for you to get taken advantage of is you, if you get an unsolicited offer and just take that first offer, you, you are usually leaving quite a bit of money on the table because that party on the other side you know, knows more than you do about the value of that property based on either current or future activity levels or expected activity levels. Uh, maybe they know that there are royalties in suspense with the operator and, you know, they're wanting to buy that property and, and claim those uh, royalties on your behalf. And so those are things you need to know before you sign a purchase and sale agreement or you sign a deed for sure. So I know I've talked to a, a few owners that have been duped, you know, unfortunately that they thought they were signing over you know, a certain percentage, but then they ended up signing over all of it, plus maybe some royalties and suspense. And, uh, you know, that's a really um, sinking feeling when you hear that on, you know, it's like, you know, a lot of times they, uh, you know, don't have the documentation to prove their side of, of the situation. And so there's really not much they can do. So that's, that's a situation where you really need to be careful before you sign that on the dotted line that you get 
uh, feel for the value of the property, and that's through getting an appraisal or evaluation from a consultant or an engineer. That is something that we specialize in at, at Silver Heels Investments is providing valuation services for minerals and royalties. You know, it's just a great feeling when I can help a, a mineral or royalty owner understand what that property's worth and then get top dollar because a lot of times they approach me and say, oh, here's the offer that I got. And then when I do the valuation, it turns out that the property was worth a lot more than that. And so they're able to use that information to negotiate a higher offer and to close it at a higher amount. And and so that's um, something that you should do, whether it's even at minimum getting multiple offers, you know, getting some competition between buyers so that you can use that as leverage to get to get more money and to get what you uh, deserve there. So uh, that's an important thing to think about as well. So the, you know some some additional resources and like um, Justin mentioned that Inveris um, DI Courthouse they have an amazing free trial. Uh, I think it's still active out there. You can just uh, we'll link to that in the in the show notes. And if you have minerals in Texas, then you can go through and search. I think I think every county in Texas on that product or service and uh, get, a, get a good ways towards doing that title search on your own, even if that um, county doesn't have those records digitized and online through the county clerk and recorder. They have title plant services, basically, that, that go out and copy those documents and digitize them and make them available, uh, and so they're, they have access to that. So that's an amazing resource if you do have uh, minerals and royalties in Texas and want to learn more there. Another thing is those county clerk and recorder websites. So again, just, you know, wherever that is located, try to search for that county clerk and recorder. It could be that that's online as well. Or the next time that you're in town, if you don't live in that um, area anymore, or or if you're traveling through that area, you can make a trip to the the courthouse and, and do that in person as well. So, so Justin, let's, um, let's talk a little bit, you know, th- you're at the point now where you've, learned a lot through all of this. And are you at a point where you have basically cleared title to all those properties that things are clean, so to speak, and that you're now just in the situation where you're waiting, perhaps if there's an unleased tract or some some wells that are permitted, you're sort of waiting for the process for the operator to come, come to that tract, hopefully drill a well so you get royalties or just maintaining and managing your your royalties. Do you want to talk about kind of where you are in the process now? Absolutely. And I I certainly wish I was at a point that I was just waiting for the operators to come. But, uh, you know, at the time, I was really focusing on the areas that I knew were the hottest um, and kind of doing the research and tracking it back that way. And as it stands today, I I don't believe I really have a full grasp on what might be out there. And so the research continues. Um, So I'm still constantly looking at research. Uh, One of the things that I've done is there are in Texas, there were a lot of newspaper articles talking about different wells and when they were spotted and different information about wells and who did it. Um, And I've used those um, legal descriptions to kind of go back as a basis point and kind of look at different properties. And one of the funny things about doing minerals in this way is, you know, all of that time and research and commitment to doing it sometimes can pay off. And sometimes it results in you finding a property that was sold in the 1950s. Um, And so it's just part of it. And um, I would say that I do on average per month, maybe a couple, three properties per month um, and just tracking the back and seeing what the status of it is today. There are a couple properties I found that there's just no active production. And so I went through the process of deeding those. And then, like you said, just kind of waiting to see if there's any activity that comes to it. And then some others um, as well that I really need to be more proactive on and go out and do some more research and try to see if there is any current activity or if there was any activity in the past four years. Well, thank you for sharing that. That I think will help a lot of people in understanding this is a marathon and not a sprint. You know, this is a journey. And so you, you know, as you learn, you'll, you'll pick up things along the way. Some of these resources that we mentioned, NARO is another great one. So that's the National Association of Royalty Owners. There's some great resources available. There's webinars that we do there. You can learn about specific subjects, whether that's around performing a royalty audit on your royalty statements, whether that's related to title searches and and clearing title and probate and things like that. 
whether it's specific to your state and some of the rules and regulations that are that are being developed, that's a great place to go. We have webinars that you can view. Um, if you're a member, you can view all the recorded web webinars and look at that information and uh, you know find out what you need to know. And you know, of course, uh, this podcast is a great resource. So definitely subscribe. And make sure that uh, you catch every every episode that comes out. Covered a lot of these topics, and we continue to cover them, you know, as things develop. And so, uh, you know, if you're in it for the long haul, want to manage your minerals and royalties, make sure your family is getting paid what they deserve. Then, of course, these are these are some great resources out there. And then, you know, the networking aspect is important too. You know, you can talk to other people that have gone through the same thing that you're going through and they can give you some tips, you know, so like what Justin's doing right now is sort of virtually kind of mentoring those of you that maybe just found out that you, re you inherited property, but then you can go and, and through narrow and attending your state conventions or maybe the national convention, you can meet other mineral rights and royalty owners that have gone through what you're going through. And so that's another great place where you can, you can learn and uh, you know, who knows you might, find that you own uh, minerals in the same area or in the same section or abstract. I know that uh, in our interview with Jack Fleet just a few weeks ago, he mentioned that, you know, during one of the uh, conventions, he was in the process of negotiating a lease and found out one of the other NARO members owned the other um, track that was part of that drilling spacing unit. And so they were able to collaborate together to get even a better offer than they would have otherwise um, going it separately. So, you know, serendipitous um, type, you know, situations like that, you, you know, who knows, you might run into somebody that you can work with to negotiate and get some some bargaining power and working with an operator or someone that is looking to lease in an area. So you mentioned you found a few other properties, you kind of have to take it step by step and pace yourself, so to speak, as you go and learn about these and find out if you're still maybe there's an interest out there, maybe it was sold. Then, you know, you, you talked about some other states. I know you mentioned that you've potentially learned that there might be properties there. And, you know, how did you learn about that? Yep. So, and we did uh, initially starting with an online search. So we kind of came across these and I noticed that in Arkansas that uh, Jake had an operator profile, which, you know, kind of leads you to believe that, okay, there may have been something at some point um, and then same with New Mexico, we came across an operator profile and kind of piqued our interest. And so in New Mexico, we said, hey, you know, that's not really many hours from from Colorado. Let's take a trip down there and, and let's go look and see. And so we did. And that was actually my first experience, actually having the books in my hands and going through these books of, of these documents. And uh, there was nothing. So it was all for naught. We went back and everything had been sold. Uh, but like I said, sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. But you know, something I think that gets uh, missed uh, is a couple of things with, with this journey, and that's that it is such a unique opportunity to go back through a timeline of your family history. And there can be so much joy in linking uh, the history that may have occurred um, and the people and getting to tell other generations about those people that maybe they wouldn't have known otherwise. And that, you know, this is, it's really something that um, I know that it has made my dad and I closer uh, because this has been an educational process for both of us. This is a, it's a lot of work for one person. Um, and you want to be sure that the next generation at least has some idea uh, what's going on. And so it's really been a fun process. And uh, I've tried hard not to let it overwhelm me, though it has at times, um, and try to, to really take it just one bite at a time. And I don't know that I'll ever stop learning. And that's one of the great things about the podcast is you can learn from somebody else's scenario and if nothing else, you can hope that you never have to run into it. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a, it's a journey, the learning side of things. And thank you for sharing your story today, because I think it is going to help a lot of people. And uh, you know, hopefully it'll help them take some of the shortcuts to learning more about what are the things that they need to do so that they're not just totally overwhelmed when they find, you know, find out that they may have inherited a, a property. And so, you know, the other thing too, is it provides hope, you know, there's, it's an amazing feeling to find out that you own an asset that, you know, you get to potentially pass down to your kids and they can pass down to their, their kids. And so this generational wealth, this, that this represents and this family legacy and the history behind it and your family, you know, there's predecessors that maybe 
were part of the land rush back in, in the, in the 1800s, or, you know, they homesteaded a property and they exchanged value by farming that land and by settling there in exchange for getting title to that property. And so you have that really cool history, you know, that you can learn about that your, your family and, you know, the genealogy that goes along with it. I know that just in the past year, we've done some research on our genealogy and, you know, going through that process, you find out some amazing things that you had no idea, you know, that, you know, had relatives back several generations before that lived in a particular area or that, you know, maybe were in the um, things like Revolutionary War, or the Civil War, and, you know, like how the history of the country and how your family is connected to that is just, uh, it's really interesting to learn about. So this is, uh, you know, it's always fun for me as well to go through and do, to run title because you're going through and learning about these things as you're looking at these historic deeds and leases and, and there's a story behind all of those, right? So that's, uh, that's the, the fun part behind all of this. So. It is. And, and just one fine, final closing note. So I have a, my sister-in-law, one of the questions that um, she asked, and she's, she's the next step in the generations, and is how do you get into this? Um, for somebody who didn't have the generational wealth, that didn't inherit them. And, um, you know, it really opened my eyes because there are thousands today, and I, I, being in Odessa, it makes me think about it even more, that started from nothing and will have those minerals to pass down to future generations. And so... Yes, maybe it's a different topic, maybe it's a different conversation, but it's n- the only way to get it is not by inheriting them. If you want to go out and, and make a name for yourself and, and build this for your next generations, that is absolutely a possibility as well. And that, that may be a different conversation we have, but I, I just don't want people to think that, oh, well, you had to have inherited it or, oh, well, this was only a chance in the 50s because there are still many men today who are making their fortune and making a legacies for generations to come. And uh, We were driving into Odessa. And I knew I was here as soon as I saw a big old white blazer or a suburban, excuse me, that had the uh, license plate, one oil man. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. You know, the inheritance is one, one route. All of us at some point, whether you're you've got multiple generations, you're, you're born in the U.S. or, or not, you know, some, you know, we're all of us at one point, our families or, or at least our relatives were immigrants, you know, the U S you know, we, we settled here, uh, unless you're, you know, native American and, you know, certainly there's a rich history of mineral ownership with, with native Americans as well. And so there's, you know, like Jack actually mentioned, you know, they have, uh, you know, he has links to one of the last tribes, uh, one of the last chiefs, uh, in one of the tribes in Oklahoma, and so he is an Alati, and so they he inherited minerals um, as you know, being um, you know a fraction Native American and, and having relatives that were in the tribe that were granted those. So you know even if you're an immigrant or if you're just coming into it and you think that you know you want to invest in real property, oil and gas is got its challenges certainly um, politically um, right now, but the fact of the matter is, is we are going to be needing oil and gas for decades to come. And, you know, having a title to mineral rights gives you the opportunity to, you know, invest in that side of the, the business. You know, maybe you don't want to invest through the stock market and feel there's, it's too vol- volatile. You want something more tangible. Well, minerals and royalties can can definitely um, fit that bill. Obviously, you need to know what you're doing. I, it's something where I've spoken with several listeners that are wanting to jump in and and invest in this space. And it's it's a it's a great thing to do. And you know, certainly wouldn't discourage anybody. But just do your homework is is kind of what I'm getting at. Make sure you have those trusted set of advisors lined up before you pull the trigger on buying your first property, so that you know what you're getting so that you know that you've checked all the boxes to make sure you're getting what you think you're getting and that you know that you're paying, you know, a fair price for it. You're not, you're not overpaying. So I think that's, you know, on the other side of things, from a purchasing standpoint, you know, there's, it's sort of this, the similar thing, you know, you want to make sure you know what you're buying. Um, There's some due diligence that's required. You know, you have to run title um, once you're under contract to make sure that you're getting what you think you're getting and protecting yourself that way. But 
you know, that's definitely doable. It's definitely something that can provide a, a legacy for, for your future generations, like Justin mentioned. So, so yeah, that's something that we've talked about a little bit in the past. And I think, you know, it's something that we will be covering in more detail in the future and, and talking about, you know, ways to invest in, in minerals and royalties and some of the opportunities there. But, uh, you know, thank you again, Justin, for sharing all of this. I think it's been really helpful to me to hear a little bit more about your story. I know we, we talked a lot about, you know, the, the process that you've gone through and things like that, but, um, you know, thank you for sort of sharing the timeline and that journey that you've gone through and kind of where you're at today and that it's, you know, the, the journey's never over, that you, you know, are continuing to learn. There's continuing, there, there's more opportunities to find out if there's other stuff out there. And so it's, you know, it's a journey like we talked about. And so thank you for sharing yours. Absolutely. And, and thank you for Matt for having me. And I, I truly hope it helps other people, if nothing else, to, to not feel discouraged because your head will certainly spin initially, but it will stop spinning and it will eventually make sense to some degree and you'll continue learning. Absolutely. And on that note, um, that wraps up this episode again. If you want to find the links to some of the resources we've mentioned in this episode, you can go to mineralrightspodcast.com and uh, make sure you're subscribed to the show. And if you would, do us a huge favor, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this. It's the best way to help us out and to help us make sure that others uh, can find this information. So thanks again, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.